Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. Even if your tax rate doesn't go up this year, you'll effectively be paying more in taxes thanks to inflation. The cost of living hit 8.1% in June of 2022, the highest in 40 years. And the Bank of Canada isn't predicting the consumer price index to return to its 2% target band until the summer of 2025. If that happens, the loonie will buy 15% less in four years, but she'll still be taxed on the dollar by the same amount. Does that seem right? Meet Bill Robson and Alexander Laurent. Bill is the CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute, and Alex is one of his directors of research. The two have co-authored a report titled Double the Pain, How Inflation Increases Tax Burdens. They join us now. Thank you for joining us. To an amazing extent, this was a crowdsourced project. Alex and I wrote at a column in the Global Mail, and it prompted a, a number of people to get in touch and say, oh yeah, here's an example. And, I, and, and, and some of the things they came up with were quite uh, outrageous, including, I don't know if you read the paper, but that foreign work, like the, the threshold for that. Um, and so we did another column. And then that prompted more feedback. So we decided, okay, well, why don't we put this research paper together? And then when we put that out for review, again, all these reviewers, like they set back more, I mean, it was more than we could uh, 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 instance, but uh, uh, it was it was an interesting example that when you, when you put the idea in front of people who got them thinking about it, suddenly they just had all these uh, uh, things that they put to us. So yeah, it was a bit of a crowdsourced thing. <laughs> well, inflation certainly affects taxes because we're still being taxed on that dollar we earn, as I mentioned, but the purchasing power of that dollar is less. So essentially, even you know, we're almost being taxed more, even if the tax rate doesn't change. Well, uh, Michael, you made a, a key point on the way in. Um, even once inflation has come back to the bank's target, which I, I think it will, um, the loss of purchasing power that occurred during the period was above target, you don't get that back. So that's that's a that's a one way thing. Uh, Inflation is like a tax in its own right. Anybody who was holding cash at the beginning of this whole episode now, as you were saying, uh, is on uh, the way to having an eighty-five cent dollar. Uh, and then the the point about taxation is that it operates in a variety of ways. But the really uh, obvious one, and what got Alex and me started on uh, the, the 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 paper that this turned into. Uh, was just looking at the income tax thresholds uh, because many of them are indexed. Actually, Canada is not bad by world standards uh, when it comes to indexing thresholds, uh, but there are some that aren't indexed. And then when we started to look at other dollar amounts that don't change even as the general level of prices go up, uh, there are a lot of them. And so inflation really does double the pain by making all of these taxes uh, uh, bite at lower uh, real thresholds of income or consumption, whatever it is that you're taxing. But Alex, you know, we've been talking a lot about inflation over the course of the pandemic, uh, but we've also been talking about wage inflation. So if the cost of living inflation is going up, but wages are going up as well, doesn't that offset the bigger tax bite? Well, as uh, as Bill just said, uh, if, if, if the thresholds are on the personal level, at least if the thresholds are not indexed for inflation, or if not all of them are, um, your tax bill will actually increase at a rate faster than inflation. That's what's good. That's that's just mathematical. Your, ta your tax bill will, think, will increase at a rate, rate faster than inflation. And if that happens in real terms, as a, ta as a, as a taxpayer, you are poorer, and the government in real term uh, is richer. And, did, and it's, it's simply the effect of not indexing all of the tax provisions to inflation. If everything was perfectly indexed and income increases exactly at the same rate as inflation, then there's no problem. Now, if, if you are richer, if your purchasing power does increase, then it, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it, it's normal that you, you'd pay a little bit more in taxes because you are effectively richer in real third. So this sort of feels like a one-two punch. I'm paying more at the grocery store, uh, and so my the my dollar doesn't go as far as it used to, but I'm still getting taxed at that level. Uh, yeah, I, 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 and of course that was going on before. I mean, inflation at two percent is a heck of a lot better than the inflation rates that we had uh, before 
inflation targeting uh, came into effect in the 1990s. But still, 2% uh, over the course of a 30-year retirement, that's going to cut uh, the nominal value of a dollar and a half. So it's not like everything was just uh, you know okay before. Uh, but the higher inflation has really brought a lot of these things into sharper relief. Uh, we've just been talking about thresholds for income tax, but here's one that hasn't changed since the GST came in uh, in, in 1991. There's a, a small supplier threshold that's specified in dollar terms. That has never changed. And so what's been happening over time is that the threshold at which uh, you would get uh, you know, drawn into the GST system has been getting lower and lower and lower. Now, maybe 30 grand wasn't the right amount, uh, when this thing was first put in place, uh, you know, we're not claiming that everything was just perfect the way it was originally. Uh, but with this higher inflation rate, uh, that ceiling uh, or that threshold at which you start paying uh, GST has come down a lot too. So if the original idea was some businesses are too small, you know, it's it's a single person kind of on his or her own, and uh, let's just not force all this compliance uh, onto them. Well. Inflation has really changed that, and so uh, a lot more people are into the GST system now than when that threshold, you know, when it was originally put in place, the idea was to accept them. Now they're in. When inflation spikes, governments are urged to provide relief by cutting taxes. You argue that this actually isn't the best way to go about dealing with this. To just to, to begin with on the thresholds, um, there are some thresholds that are still not indexed uh, to inflation at all. The, uh, at least at the provincial level in Ontario, there are two thresholds: the top two, uh, one hundred fifty thousand dollar and two hundred twenty thousand um, dollars. They're they're not indexed to inflation at all, and they were introduced in twenty fourteen. And even with low two percent inflation, uh, it compounds, like Bill just said. And right, th their value uh, right now and it should should be. Um, at least I, I you can have a look in the paper, but at least twenty to twenty five percent lower. Well, in twenty fourteen it would have been twenty to twenty five percent lower than than the thresholds at the time. Now they, they should be higher, but the point is, provinces like Ontario, but also there's PI and there's Nova Scotia that simply they still don't index any thresholds at all. And, but that's the, those are just the thresholds, and the thresholds it's the easiest to identify. Like what, if, if we dig deeper, we identify many different thresholds, not only on the personal side, but also on the like Bill was saying on the, on the consumption tax side, also customs um, uh, yeah. thresholds for businesses. Uh, so, so there's all sorts of different ones. Uh, deductions, deductions is very important. The one that I like to point out all the time is the deductions for childcare expenses. In 1998, for a young child, it was $7,000. It's now $8,000. So there's been an increase. But if but from 1998 to now, it really should be $12,000. So people with kids, their effective tax rates is actually much higher now than it was in 1998 at, 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 because the, it's a sizable deduction. The example that Alex just gave, it's a very telling one in that if uh, a finance minister had come forward and said, well, we're going to uh, change the thresholds here so that people are starting to pay tax at a much lower rate, People would have balked if they would have said, "Like, why? What's the logic of that? Uh, and I, you know, how dare you do that?" Um, and inflation is making it happen without any attention. So, in terms of thinking how governments might react, going back to the question that you asked, I, I guess our starting place is: well, first, make sure that the damage that's being done by these things aren't moving uh, doesn't occur. And then, and then, once you've arrested that rot, once you've once you've uh, address the things that are causing the taxation by stealth that you can easily fix. Well, then there are a lot of other things to talk about. Um, but that's a good example of one where if anybody had said deliberately, let's let's do this or let's lower the threshold for uh, being in the GST system to half of what it was originally worth, uh, people would have said that's a crazy idea, but that's what inflation has done. 
So, Alex, as you point out, you your report cites the federal child care expense deduction as a perfect example of how inflation has eroded a tax break. Seven thousand bucks a decade ago is not seven thousand bucks today. What are some of the other thresholds and in personal income taxes that have gone unindexed, or what are the implications? An interesting one is the Norton residence deduction. Uh, just a few years ago, it's not indexed to inflation, but it does increase periodically. Government does increase it periodically. The last time the government increases it, it they they said, well, you know, it, it's to um, it, it, it's essentially to, to give some tax relief. Well, you know, are you really giving tax relief, or you're just taking advantage of the fact that some provisions are not in, indexed to inflation at all, and so when when you decide to do a change, you're you're not maybe not even catching up completely to inflation, but you're still announcing tax relief or tax break. It's kind of a um, it's it's not a totally honest way to to deal with your uh, to deal with your tax system and your tax change. Like much better to automatically index all of them. And 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 yes, there there are many more. There's uh, there's credits. There's uh, even benefits. There's some another another one that I, I think is is interesting because it, it does actually touches many many people. It's the the GIS, the Guaranteed Income Supplement. It's de de determined every year based on your income, but you can exempt from that income a portion that is earned from employment. So that that's a great thing, right? So that it gives an incentive for people. To, for retirees to work, right, and and not have their GIS cut because there's a huge comeback for GIS is fifty percent, and if it's at a really low level of income, it's even seventy five percent of the income you earn. So the first the first five thousand dollar of income is exempt from GIS clawback. Then the next half, the, then on the next ten thousand dollar of income you earn, half of it is also exempt. From the clawback, so in total is ten thousand dollar. This is this is pretty new, but it's not indexed to inflation. So in twenty years from now, this is not going to be worth as much as it is today. It's going to be insignificant. So again, index it to inflation so that future retirees enjoy the same incentives to work as current retirees. Here, here, I'll, I'll jump in with one uh, as well which is pretty salient right now as everybody's fretting about the high cost of housing and, and federal government's under all of this pressure uh, to do something about it. When the GST came in, there was a new housing rebate uh, that would lower the amount of GST uh, on new houses, but it phased out uh, between the value of 350000 and $450,000 that wasn't available uh, for homes over $450,000. Well, that was then. Uh, nowadays, if you live in any major city, uh, good luck finding a house uh, for less than $450,000. They've never changed the threshold. So as a result, this thing that was supposed to provide GST relief on modest uh, homes, you know, modest priced homes, it's, not, it's effectively not available to anybody. Uh, so that's something that they really ought to have addressed. Because again, you go back to the day, if somebody originally proposed that it should be uh, instituted at a level where if effectively nobody could take advantage of it, it would have been seen as a, a, a completely silly thing to do. Uh, but now inflation has actually put us in that position. And so that's a good example of a threshold that has changed so much that it's almost become irrelevant to have that uh, rebate at all. Yeah, good luck finding a parking space in downtown Toronto for less than 450 grand. Uh, Canada's senior governments uh, tax small businesses at a lower rate than the big players. And you sort of touched on this already. We haven't seen that threshold change since 2009. What would the economic benefit be to indexing this segment of the economy? I might take a dart uh, for this, so let me jump in ahead of Alex. Uh, we're not huge fans of, uh, well, Alex can speak for himself. I have a lot of doubts that the um, small business deduction actually makes a ton of sense. Uh, uh, there's evidence that businesses will slow down their growth when they get to the thresholds, either in terms of income or assets, that, that qualify for that. So it might actually be an obstacle to businesses growing in the economy at 
and some of the economic development and productivity gains that we'd like to see. Having said all that, um, having inflation correct a problem uh, by stealth, it's it's still a problem. Uh, it's still kind of offensive to accountability. I think that if there's to be a change in that regime, and maybe there should be, we often argued that it would be better to uh, provide lower tax rates for young businesses rather than small businesses. So the startup gets the help when it's still a fledgling enterprise and doesn't have a tax account yet. Um, uh, but and then and then go from there. Um, but one way or another, if you're going to make the change, make it overtly, uh, and uh, don't allow inflation to do your dirty work for you. So. Even some of the tax provisions that we're not necessarily enthusiastic about in their own right, our position would be on the basis of transparency and accountability, uh, index those thresholds, and then have a, a very straight out discussion about whether the tax provision makes sense in the first place. Right. $500,000 20 years ago went a lot further than $500,000 in revenue this time around. But uh, Alex, should uh, we also sharpen the pitchforks for you too on this topic? No, I, I completely agree with with Bill. Of course, uh, on on the small business deduction, another uh, another um, uh, thing that government could do if they if they ever eliminated the deduction, it, it could be to provide immediate expensing um, for all businesses, small or large, up to a maximum amount, and that maximum amount of immediate immediate expensing would be worth so much more for a small business than a large business. So it's there are other ways that have been suggested in the literature that we could deal with the, the small business taxation problem. Yeah, index the amount so that you don't end up with this kind of creep, you know, the ceiling coming down on them the same way it's doing currently. Well, whether or not a company expands can sometimes depend on capital cost allowances. Buying more equipment to meet demand comes with a tax benefit. Is that tax benefit indexed to inflation? A very good point. Uh, Indexing thresholds is pretty straightforward, and in our paper, we say do that first because it's really simple. Um, when it comes to some other provisions, things do get more complicated, and I'll, uh, you didn't ask about it, but I'll, I'll mention a really, really tough one, and that is uh, when you're paying interest, uh, you're paying sort of a real interest rate, and then there's an inflation premium on top of that. Uh, as an investor receiving interest, you get taxed on the whole amount, whether it's mostly inflation or even potentially all inflation, uh, or, or whether it's actually a real return. So there's some real tough nuts to crack. On the particular question that you asked, um, yes, businesses pay more tax because we have historical cost accounting uh, that determines your depreciation for tax purposes. And so when inflation is higher, uh, the tax burden on businesses does go up and the tax burden on investment particularly goes up. Now, that's that ought to be a, a, a big concern in Canada right now because we have a very weak uh, business investment. And so we ought to be looking at all of the tax provisions that are a problem in that regard. You can index the, the, the cost base for your depreciation uh, to inflation. So technically it's possible, uh, but this is a complicated area where um, countries with much higher inflation rates than Canada for a long time have had difficulty dealing with it. If inflation is going to stay high, we ought to be looking at that. Uh, for the moment, though, I just say let's just put that in the column of tax provisions that interact with inflation in a painful way. Let's get inflation down. And if it turns out that for whatever reason, oh, I suppose the government were to raise the inflation target. They've, they've just reconfirmed that the bank Canada is supposed to get down to 2%, so I'm not raising a, a, an alarm about something that might actually happen, but there's no shortage of voices saying we should have a higher inflation target. If the government were to go to something where inflation was going to be higher on an ongoing basis as a result of like their own deliberate uh, instruction to the Bank of Canada, at that point, I think we would go back to a lot of these things that are tougher to deal with, including the historical cost base uh, for depreciation or historical cost base for capital gains tax and say, okay, we've got to fix that now because with a higher inflation rate, that creates all kinds of distortions and it increases the tax bite in a way that's very difficult for people to understand even and certainly to get around. So we've talked about the impact of inflation on taxation uh, for corporations, uh, for small business, uh, for investors. Let's bring it back to those who are none of those. What does inflation mean for consumption taxes like GST and HST? 
it usually it usually consumption tax like the GST or HST it's um in Latin ad valorem so it's 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 taxed on on the value of your purchase so it's it's not it's going to go up with with your real purchasing power so it's not really you're not gonna, really going to be adversely affected by it. there's a, a a threshold for for snacks uh you know you know, like very small purchases uh, that are exempt from uh from from gst that's uh that that's quite small it's got smaller real terms but another a weird interaction uh and, and this combines two things that irritate people uh, to, to varying amounts is that um for whatever reason this is a matter of sort of consumer perception but it's often a uh, lot more uh, attractive to uh, uh, some, uh, a food vendor to reduce the size of a package uh, rather than to increase the price on the package so shrinkflation is a topic and we're all you know when you buy coffee you're checking is that actually a pound bag of coffee or they shrink it now to you know 300 and something grams well um the threshold the, the the rules of the gst and and what's a snack food to which it would apply versus grocery to which it didn't a lot of that uh, does depend on the size of the container so there's this bit of a whammy that could happen that if a container that got smaller so instead of being a grocery it's now a snack so it's attracting gst so um, these are kind of funny little interactions um but they're sort of illustrations of a more general point that even as alex said uh on a, you know a consumption tax it's a, it's a percentage on whatever the cost was so in a sense it's automatically indexed but when you have these hard edged things these thresholds uh yeah you get these interactions and so it would make sense to look at those as well so it's the solution to just have all levels of government, because as you pointed out, you know, some provinces don't, and provinces like Ontario do up to a certain percent or a degree, is the solution to just have all levels of government index all thresholds to inflation? I think that's a very good place to start. Um, just as, as as you were saying that, an example of a consumption tax that's relatively new uh, came to mind. The federal government recently imposed a luxury tax on uh, expensive cars, boats, and aircraft. Um, the threshold for that tax, uh, 100 grand for a car, uh, for, for some reason, 100 grand for an aircraft. If anybody wants to sell me an airplane for less than 100, I guess I'll look at it carefully to decide whether I want to fly in it. But 100 grand on a car seems like a fairly high amount, right? But you look at what's happening with electric vehicles and, and the cost of vehicles, and then you just uh, play it forward a little bit in time. Uh, that's not going to seem like such a high amount oh, uh, after 10 years have gone by, uh, even if inflation is back to 2% with the escalating costs as a result of you know forbidding internal combustion engines and so on. So uh, why, when they first put that in place, would they have just said, okay, starting at 100 grand, and it's going to go up with the CPI? So all of these things, I think, when, when, when the thresholds are already there that need to be indexed, yes, they should do that. But also when they're putting new taxes in place, they should be thinking ahead and they should say, okay, let's just make sure that these dollar amounts might look sensible today. Uh, but uh, even with 2% inflation over time, they're going to go down in real terms and inflation is going to be higher than that. They're going to go down faster in real terms. Yeah, it would be a good start. But we just index everything. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and insight today. Thank you. Bill Robson is the CEO of the C.D. Howe Institute. Alexandre Laurent is the Director of Research at the Institute. Read the report, Double the Pain, How Inflation Increases Tax Burdens, at cdhowe.org. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.